G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Sunir Shah from AppBind. He's based in San Francisco, USA. Thanks for your time today, Sunir. i uh, love to. Uh, thanks for having me, Troy. I'm actually in Toronto. That's where we are. We're a remote company. Oh, and it's a Canada hat. I looked, I looked on your website and it said San Francisco. So that's where I posted. Yeah, that's right. The company's oh. in San Francisco, but I live in Toronto. Got it. Now Got I'm it. Rooted here. Yeah, for sure. Let's start with how we know each other. So one of the pod matching websites, Bedina, we, we connected on there. That's right. I have, it's a, yeah, pretty the service. I use them. That's right. Yeah. Tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. So AppBind, we help digital consultants and agencies set up your clients faster and all the software plugins, ad networks you might have by letting you sign up on their behalf without yourself getting stuck in the middle of the billing, which is really the problem. And, you know, just like a plumber would never make a client buy their own pipes and pumps, uh, you know, nor should you uh, make your client go buy their own stuff. But then you get into building systems, which is where the real money is by building retainers around systems. So that's what AppBind does. And uh, it's a problem that hasn't been solved before. We had to solve it. Yep. Fantastic. And how did you start out? Well, I mean, the true story uh, is long and winding, but I'll give you a two, <laughs> a bridge version. Yep. I actually been trying to solve this problem for well over a decade. I was, I started the marketing team at FreshBooks, which is invoicing for all the consultants whatever. And if you're in Australia, obviously you might know zero. Yep. So I've been talking to, you know, Rod Rory over there for ages about this too. But the, the uh, you know, this problem has been manifest for the subscription era for ages, but myself, I was been consulting as well uh, back and forth in my career. And actually it was, a, it was the last time I was consulting just before I started applying where I had, I got fired by a client, you yep. know, and, and <laughs> that's actually a good story. If you want to, yeah, tell if you want to get into it, please do. Yeah. I, I hate the story. It's therapy though. So let's, let's, uh, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I got fired by a client and what happened was I was doing analytics consulting. Uh, I was doing amplitude and segment and branch, but you know, he was a fashion retailer. He was making a line of clothes and he was building a bricks and mortar store. And there was an e-commerce site and I was subcontracted to do the conversion rate optimization. And like any digital consultant, I didn't want to sign up for anything for him. I didn't want to buy Amplitude or Segment or, you know, VWO or any of these tools because they're expensive. There is his data. So every Monday on the project sync, I'd said, you know, could you go sign up for things? He's sure. He said, sure, sir. Sure, sure, sure. But of course he didn't because it's like Bayesian math. He doesn't care. He's like stitching clothes, you know, he's doing something crazy, you know, and with his hands. He's like really busy. And then finally, 72 hours from launch, he noticed the one thing he could notice, there's no phone number on the website because I was talk desk, my thing. And he said, Sierra, what the hell? And I was like, well, you didn't sign up for anything, I said. So he said, okay, let's get on a video call. Let's do it. Okay. So I, you know, like a child, I'm talking to him. I'm like, click here, put your email in here, put your password in here, click here to invite me. And he's, an, he's a go-getter, right? Uh, and he was just, after an hour of his remaining 72 hours, we got through two subscriptions. He just let, let me have it. And this plumber analogy I mentioned at the beginning actually came from him. But it was so true. He said, because he was building a store, a physical store. So he literally said, my plumber is not making me buy my own pipes in here. I expected you to take care of this for me. Working with you is 10 times harder than not working with you. And I'm like, oh, yes. So I said, no problem. Get off the call. Uh, I put, I bought the remaining stuff on my own credit card and then canceled my credit card immediately because I didn't want to get <laughs> renewed and cover his expenses. Worked all night, delivered, and got paid. And of course, he fired me. And then I asked uh, you know, I asked him a month later, we actually had a good rapport because I was one of the adults on the project. And it was just, you know, give me entrepreneur to entrepreneur feedback because this I had this idea for AppBind of solving this problem for a while. I just want to understand his experience as a client. And he said, yes, yeah, not only did you slow down the project and confuse me and I expect you to take care of it because, like, you know, normally contractors take care of this. But didn't you have to do an all nighter, senior? How could you even manage your own time? I was like, that's true. And I asked him, when did you decide to fire me? And this is the part of the story I just hate. I can't, I never, it never stopped hurting. He said, the first call, senior. I'm like, what? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> swearing is appropriate. That's the time to swear. That's yep. the moment. And I was like, what? You know, what? And 
And he said, no, Sunil, don't get me wrong. I was mad at you at the end, but you asked me to think about this for you as a, as a friend. And so I thought about it. It was the first call when I realized that I this was not going to continue. I mean, you sounded like you knew what you're talking about. And of course, I would do the analytics and then the conversion rate optimization, and then I'd sell on the ads and I'd keep going. And if I was successful, I'd probably have an agency. I wouldn't have AppBind. But what he said to me is like, the moment you put things back onto my plate that I didn't understand, and I knew that you could, you couldn't do it for some reason. Like subscriptions, yeah, I don't really, you didn't really get it. But it's like, sure. I knew I had to hire someone internally to solve the problem, but I just didn't have time before launch. Yeah. And that's what he had done since subsequently he had hired a head of marketing and to, you know, to take over. That's what I had to do. That's what I, I realized was the only solution. That's what he said. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's for sure. And that was, uh, that was 20, uh, 16. Uh, and then we started AppBind in 2018 to solve this problem. Uh, it was like, it's really complicated in the back end, but really simple on the front end, yep. you know, and it was, I had to come up with a really simple way and really, you know, what's a subscription email and credit card. So we create a shared email and a shared virtual credit card that you can sign up on behalf of a client. Yep. Uh, you get all the emails, you manage the account, all the credit card charges the client instead of you. And then at the end of the project, you just transfer the email and credit card to the client. Very simple. Uh, but allows me to just get through this whole problem and, you know, be a good digital plumber. I'll take care of it for you. That's yeah. what you want to say. I can set up everything. Um, yeah. I mean, that was uh, one of my many lessons consulting for <laughs> sure. It's a brilliant idea because, and for the audience, the, the virtual credit card. So I assume the way it works is you generate this virtual credit card, which you can then use to subscri subscribe to things. And then the ultimate charge flows through to his business credit card. That's how it works. That's right. That's so right. You don't, you don't have why, You don't want to be in the middle of the money. I mean, yeah. it's high risk. Yeah. yeah. Why that's would you it. want that? Yeah. And messy. Yeah. If you're putting all your client charges on your own credit cards, that's just a nightmare. Oh my God. The bookkeeping alone. And yeah. that, but the interesting thing we saw too, is not only do you get the expenses off your books, that's what everyone thinks about. That's your Tuesday afternoon problem. I just want to get this. I want to get this thing done and I don't want to put it on my credit card. That's the, that's your Tuesday afternoon problem. I just want the subscription. But what we found, and I, you know, this is a bit of uh um, you have to leap of faith for some people, but what it found is that people started selling systems. So because instead of selling subscriptions or work, you're selling now the whole system. And that actually is a product. I mean, your, your tech company too is a tech, a digital consultant. It just, you may not be building the software, but like a plumber doesn't make the pipes. They build a, you know, they put the pipes and pumps and valves to put together a plumbing system. Yep. You know, an industrial plumber would have a 10 year contract to maintain that, right? And these are actually turns out if when you sell certain systems, you know, you can build longer term retainers. And then for me, when I was 18, I worked for a Microsoft, we called it value at a reseller or system integrator, dev shop. You know, that's exactly how we worked. You know, we would buy computers, networking cables, Windows license SDKs, build systems, put our labor on it, deliver it. But the president of that consulting firm, I mean, it was 18. I was like, a, you know, the teacher's pet at that place. They were just like, oh, so cute. You have questions? Like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, Sunir, we're not selling your labor. I mean, do, do, do put your head down and type faster. We need to deliver on time. But you're just the hello. We're selling the system. The client only wants to buy the result. They want the system, not your time. But more importantly, that gives us a three-year contract or service that, which means we're talking to that client every month, every quarter, then we can sell the next system, the next system that becomes a tenure client. That's how it used to be. And that's kind of what things are returning to. You see people on AppBind moving to that, you know, and you get off this uh, crazy thing that I think anyone who's a consultant listening to this would understand called the scalability trap, the treadmill yep. of hell where yes. selling labor, labor, it's awful. The more revenue you make, the more payroll you must have. The payroll turns over. You have to get more revenue. You can never scale your way out of risk as a consultant without building something that you own. Like, what yep. do you own as a consultant? Yeah. Yep. So in 2018, when you started AppBind, how old were you? <laughs> Interesting question. <laughs> uh, I was uh, 39. 39? Yeah. Yeah, great. And do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business over the last four years? Yeah, we grow, we've been growing, uh, we actually launched in 2020. Uh, and then we have, you know, probably about a thousand agencies signed up. We've been growing 15% month over month. Right. Uh, they're managing over 500 different SaaS products because we're also signing them up uh, as well. Um, yeah, it's been interesting to see it actually take off. Yep. For sure. And how many team members did you start with and where are you at now? It was just my co-founder and I for a long time, my co-founder, Joe. He was at QuickBooks. I was at FreshBooks. You know, we're definitely accounting nerds. <laughs> uh, and now we have five people, you yeah. know, one marketer, uh, three devs and myself. Yep. And I'm a jack of all trades as a CEO. I do everything. 
Of course. <laughs> when was the moment you felt like you had succeeded? I don't think I felt like that. Um, I don't think I ever felt like that at any company I've ever worked at. I mean, uh, I work in tech. So, I mean, the moment you think you've succeeded is the moment you get destroyed. Yep. I mean, I mean, all these crypto disasters, I'm not a crypto fan by any imagination. They're just, I enjoy them because it's the, the hubris of all these arrogant CEOs who think crypto is here forever. And then now they're wiped out. It's like, I enjoy that because <laughs> that's tech. Yep. For you. you should never ever think you're successful. Bill Gates never thought he was successful, right? Because, you know, the, 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 the next, next wave is coming. Yep. Right. Yep. Definitely. You can't stand on, on, on your own feet for too long. What does success look like to you? To me, uh, weirdly, I mean, I don't know if you can see who's on my wall. There's Gandhi G over here. Yep. I, I realized, I mean, the pandemic really, it was a wild time to start a company. And 2020 was a really tough year. Uh, we were just talking about it, the impact on our families. The, the, uh, by the end of the year, this is my Christmas present to myself. I bought a poster of Gandhi. Um, to me, it just reminded me, like my, my career objective, it's not about money. It's to make the internet a more glorious place. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? To me, to me, I find, uh, despite what many people think, the internet can is a great uh, development of human humanity. And so, for me, I got interested in this problem because when I was at FreshBooks, I saw thousands of agencies just go they get sucked down into the scalability trap because of subscriptions. And there are small businesses too. I mean, it was very difficult for them to scale risk. And if those small businesses are not successful, their clients are also small businesses can't get served, and it, it's a real problem because if you look at if you think that you know, internet software is, is growing quickly. It isn't. The PC revolution was way faster and bigger than anything that we see. Yep. You know, the SaaS is only uh, like a fifth of the overall software market, you know, still. It's been 25 years. The PC revolution took, you know, I don't know, eight years to get to this size or something like that. You know, I just, it's just like, to me, all the, all the possibilities um, of what technology can be matters. And so for me, success is seeing... Uh, I honestly don't. The money matters, but the investors care about them. They'll let the, the investors will make me care about that. People yeah. will care about the money for me. But for me, if I don't hear about a, a, someone's business or life getting better every day, I get depressed. Yeah, because I don't really see the point at all. First, I, that's for me. I just need to see it every day. Yeah. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business. Uh, the number one thing is to assume that you don't know anything all the time and just talk to the customer. I used to say to my team, um, they give me all these ideas all the time at FreshBooks, Olark. And I was like, you know what? Honestly, you already work for me. So I don't, you're already inside the four walls of the company. So I no longer care what you think. Tell me what a customer has to say. Yep. And, you know, uh, it was actually really, really difficult during the pandemic to get out of the, my basement right, and talk to people. Um, I normally, I, I'm a, I like, I mean, I run cocktail parties all the time, so I'm usually out in the world, but you just have to like get out of your own mind every day because yep. I've seen when I was consulting as well, I was consulting to all these CEOs, uh, this last round. So I was doing management consulting. I was surprised how many companies, uh, I got to the point where the CEO had not talked to a customer in over 12 months, sometimes 24 wow. months. Yeah. And then when I asked them, what's your corporate goal? And they said more revenue. Like that's, you know, if, if you drive, wherever you look is where you're going to drive, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at your bank account, right? That's the only place you can go. But the problem is your bank account already has all your money, yeah. right? Your goals have to be externally in the external market. And so if you don't have the discipline of talking to customers every day, even as a CEO, no matter how big your company is, um, you're going to be, you're, you're, what's, you're not going to market. You're not going to understand what you're doing. And I think that's probably the biggest mistake especially for a fast-growing company you're so base focused on internal problems because you're trying to grow that company that losing the discipline of talking to customers is a mistake and intuit is like famously like scott cook was famously like aggressive about that no matter how fast into it grew yeah he, he tried to stay with the customers all the time same with fresh books mike was always talking to customers all the time yeah because we can get caught in that bubble of living in our own bubble and group think kick in and we we think this is what the customers want fuck's sake just ask them you know, don't, don't make assumptions. We know what assumptions make of us. So go out there and listen to the people that are actually going to be paying and bringing that revenue that the CEO is so focused on. Yeah. And I know it sounds like a hand waving, like chintzy answer to say, talk to customers every day. Uh, Cause it, it kind of is, but there's like discipline and tactics to do it. Uh, but I just see no one doing it uh, at fast growing companies, but there are some things you should do. Like we took at FreshBooks, we took customers out for dinner wherever we went. 
you know, like in person, because it's the, when you're working through glass, like through the computer, you know, it dehumanizes everything. Yeah. So, and the other thing we do at FreshBooks is that we had a 1-800 number that everyone, it had to be answered within four rings. Someone had to answer it. So it would ring to everybody. Everyone did support. And, you know, we did all hand support at Olark and FreshBooks. And we do it at AppBind. You know, everyone has to talk to customers at some point, every, at least every week, you know, and then if you're going anywhere, go meet them in person, do phone them up randomly, you know, just to see how they're doing, you know, connect with them on Twitter and like follow the, like, be engaged with their normal lives. Just so, yeah. you know, maybe not all of them, but find some customers you get to know, even a, no matter what level you are. You know, enterprise rent a car, no matter who who they hire, what level, everyone works in the retail store for I think six months before yeah. they're even allowed to the headquarters. Yeah, you know, these are really important things to do. Totally agree. For sure. How did you fund the business? <laughs> uh, we fr- we have like friends and family initially, and then we raised a, a venture round through FFBC, and we were in five hundred startups as well. Oh, great! Yep, that's a good program. I've heard. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay. If you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? Well, I would say partner tech is growing very, very quickly. So in in this is quite inside baseball nerdy stuff, but inside software as a service, uh, because of the nature of subscriptions, almost everything is sold direct, like from the directly from the software manufacturer, we call them vendors, directly to the customer. Because you sign up directly, talk to direct sales, direct marketing. Uh, so indirect has been quite damaged. However, most of the software is sold through partners, 65% of licensed software sold through partners, but 23% of SaaS is sold through partners. However, what's growing very, very quickly, I run the trade association, the cloud software association is partner tech right now because you've met, everyone's maxed out direct sales. So, so, uh, or I mean, at least as an industry, it's getting to max. So yes, I would invest in partner tech. However, it's still uh, it's still early days because no one has figured out the predictable way to generate revenue through partners yet. Uh, so there's a lot of land to take, you know, this is, this is like, bef- imagine marketing before marketing automation. That's kind of where partnerships is right now. So it's a kind right. of interesting space. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey? So our audience can learn from it. Mm, I've had so many, um, I would say with AppBind, I was, uh, it was definitely, um, getting hit with the pandemic right as we're launching so our demo day for 500 startups was march 26 2020 my big conference that i run annually to target the SaaS companies is was april 15th 2020 right we launched january 2020 and then we're just and then it wasn't just that i couldn't market app buying but i mean everyone's lives were disrupted like you know kids were at home right and and how do we deal with it i mean um just you know, at some point, uh, you have to also think, I have like some philosophical, I'm a philosophical person, obviously I'm getting on my wall. So one thing, first, I think we're all aristocrats. If you're in tech, you basically are not going to die with an empty belly. I mean, you basically made it. It's very hard to fail out of this industry. So no matter how painful it was and how risky it was, um, I figured I'd be fine no matter what. So I had to let go of it. Uh, every time I was got worried about the company, I get worried about it every day. Uh, it just freezes me up. It's just useless. You know, I, it's good to feel, I like to feel detached from my own. I know, I know it sounds, investors want you to be all in, but I actually find that's quite disruptive. I, I need to feel separate from it. You know, if you read the e-myth, you want to be the owner, not the bit manager. Like, that's right. Different, right. And then the other thing is um, we were very open inside our community. Uh, and I, I was, I led, I was very open with myself and that actually allowed a lot of the tension in the conversations to go away. People, I think everyone got there in the end everywhere, but we did it very quickly. And, uh, you know, if I was having a rough time, people would forgive you and give you another chance. Right. But if you try to hide that, you know, I think that's one of the, you know, then, then people get weird about it. I think that's one of the best things about the pandemic. People got to see each other as people because you get the zoom was in people's lives, right. Right. Yeah. It wasn't the office. And I take that forward. I mean, I think that's a very important thing. Hopefully we can take forward in business, like this game of partnership poker or business poker, where you're trying to hide your cards. I, I don't get it. I mean, it's just a, there's always a business case. We're just people. We're trying to make the best decision for both our businesses. That, that was actually a very important thing to do in 2020 to get us through this. And we got, you know, the investment round, we got customers, we got things like that. 
Yeah, I've just looked at one of my um, quotes when you mentioned about freezing, you know, about worrying about the business every day, but I'm sure you'll appreciate this one. The future depends on what we do in the present. And that was obviously Gandhi. Yes, that's right. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Uh, I have to work on the most sales. So I'm a comp sci by training. And I like to say I do marketing. I got, I'm doing marketing through a series of unfortunate life decisions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I used to work on the C++ language track, uh, you know, and I know Bjorn Strosup. I worked on all these things. I worked on Wikipedia, got that off the ground. But uh, here I am doing this stuff, marketing. And so it's not natural for me. I do, I do enjoy the marketing side of it. But sales is, you know, scary for a lot of people. And I'm not the best uh, at sales follow-up. I'm not, I'm not like... I'm not because I'm not motivated by money, so I don't I don't like hound people to death. And I think that's a discipline that I that I, I'm working on getting better at. I'm fine on an individual call, but I like like the, like the twenty calls it takes to close someone. Yeah, like, I don't care. Yep. And and that's something. It doesn't matter whether I care or not. It has to get done. Yes. So I just have to make it fun for me. That's all. And people get afraid of it. But you know, if you're gonna go into Indian philosophy, you know, it's like you want to enjoy the pain. I mean, it's just a part of life. It's not going to kill you. So you're going to find a way to make it uh, something you can dance to, so to speak, you know, uh, and enjoy it no matter how painful it is. The pain is fake. It's an illusion in your mind anyway. Right. So like, no one's actually attacking you when you're doing sales. So it's <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. What have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth? Uh, fundraising. I mean, I think everyone would agree that is quite aggravating. Uh, the pandemic made it very weird as well, but uh, it takes a long time. It took a year to close our round, all the legal and all that stuff. I find I'm a Canadian too. And so as I've, I've expressed to every American lawyer I've ever talked to, uh, American laws are crazy. And like as a Canadian, like we have much more simple to follow laws because um, we don't, in, we're not, we don't innovate in the law in Canada. We just prescribe the right thing to do. And that seems to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yep. in America, the law is a free market of itself. And so it's very hard for me to wrap my head around. And so I, I just uh, found it very distracting. Um, but, you know, I like building stuff. I don't like uh, fundraising. That's a lot of uh, effort. It's, it takes a lot longer than what most people think. Yeah. Oh, yes. What do you love most about growing a small business? Like I said, I, I, I just like seeing what I do make people's lives better. And I've improved something. Um, in a meaningful way. I like to say, I used to joke, like I wanted to enrapture people. And my goal was to enrapture you. <laughs> so what does that mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you know, I, I, want, I wanted to show that I truly did understand and care about someone in a genuine, complete way, you know, and the problems and that I understand it and I care about you and I'm going to solve it. I'm going to work on it and you can rely on me. And that, that really pretty much, like, was the, um, you know, in the universe of people who are uncaring, you know, seemingly, you know, showing a little bit of care for someone is quite a lot of things. And to me, you know, what is life about? I mean, it's about this. I mean, we're all here in a tapestry of, of lives. I mean, businesses and, you know, capitalism is just a, a, a effective game in order to do this at scale. And I enjoy that. I mean, simple as that. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Uh, I used to think at the beginning that I had to be like a hustle and flow CEO as a startup founder, you know. The whole and, Gary V you know, mindset. Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't subscribe uh, to. <laughs> oh yeah. Even Noah Kagan who's my friend. Yeah. Gary V, uh, I find it's too much, but you know, no no does a lot. And Noah's, I think Noah's app sumo, isn't he? Yes, that's right. He was like yeah. employee number seven at Facebook or 12 or something. That's right. Yeah, just, I used yeah. to listen to his podcast. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Um, the, but you know, in listening to, I mean, he, I don't think he would even agree with my summation. But my takeaway is that you know, you just got to do all these things. But I can't do them all. In fact, I spent all day today editing video. You know, for, uh, I, was, I didn't know how to delegate it, so I had to I did it. But that's kind of stupid stuff instead of growing the business. Yeah, and so. Like, and I don't know how to do outbound sales. I mean, I, I don't enjoy it. I mean, I'd rather have someone who enjoys doing outbound sales. So, uh, you know, I got to focus on what I can deliver the most value at, right? And try to move the biggest risks out, off the plate as a CEO and then let other people do it. The only difficulty is if you don't have money, it becomes hard to bring other people in, Yeah. right? 
So that's the, you know, that's the, uh, that's really the real trick of a startup. It's like, can you find enough money in the short term that you can finally hire out the people who are going to do the things that you can't do? Yep. Right. If you can do that, then you succeeded. And if you haven't, then you didn't. But I mean, I don't know. Should like I said, judging yourself, judging yourself for what you should be as an like as an identity concept again is an illusion in your mind. Like no one's saying that to you, right? Who's saying that to you? It's only you. Yep. Right. It's crazy. So like just write on a piece of paper, put it on the wall, and then burn it. I mean, what else are you gonna do? Don't burn it on your wall. You burn your house down. But like. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to, to develop and maintain. Well, like I said earlier, if you don't talk to customers every goddamn day, you are, I've seen it so many times, so many times, you know, both amongst all my SaaS friends, uh, I'm like, you know, at my at FreshBooks, all the consult, you know, if you, the moment you stop talking to customers, because you're focusing on the business, you know, it's like on the business or in the business, that whole thing. But if you're not, being on the business, working on the business means you have to be in the market, you know, like, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't want to be in the wall, four walls. You need to be in the market under just like steering the ship. You're the captain. Right. And that, that is just an unbelievable common mistake. I understand if you can get swept up in the in inner workings of your company, but you know, ultimately that's where every company ends up hitting the, hitting the, the reef, you know, because you don't see it. Jump over to growasmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. It's very simple. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Um, yeah, if I... So we hired a lot of people that we knew uh, on the dev side. So the CTOs, people that he's worked with before. So that's been quite helpful. I had a hard time finding a marketer that I worked with, but to work with. Um, but um, what I ended up doing is I stopped trying to hire from the SaaS side of the business. All my, all my networks in SaaS the software side that I hired for their marketing agency. And that, cause that's a target customer. So I hired a marketer who was the customer. And so if you're hiring, I think that makes a lot of sense. If you're hiring yep. sales or marketing, you want to have someone that empathizes with the target yep. customer mm -hmm. rather than empathize with you. You know, I'm trying to bridge a gap between my mind and the customer's mind. I come from a different side of the table and I was hiring from my side of the table. And that was a mistake. That was the thing I learned is like, so I actually then delegated the whole KPI around uh, the marketing, re reaching marketing agencies who are core market for now to a head of marketing who's from a marketing agency. And that has gone a lot better. Yeah, for sure. Great idea. What are some things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Oh, that's a really deep question. I actually had an investor who got really mad at me because he didn't like my like the, the our cultural values. And I was like, what are you talking about? I didn't understand. I imagine it was DEI stuff. Uh, to me, uh, to me, the most important thing, I say this all the time, is when I am working with you from nine to five, I have a role where I'm your boss, right? And then we go home and then we're neighbors, yeah. right? And then we're just, we're just adults working together. You, you have a role, I have a role. Hopefully we both be enriched from doing this and we're successful, but I'm just a person. And I don't hide my anxiety or fear or negative emotions from my staff, but I don't make it their problem either because negativity, if you're, if you are truly an adult, you take your negative, your, you have negative emotions. We all do. We're humans, right? But your, your goal is not to take their negativity and make it a gift to someone else. So they, you know, have negativity. I mean, they should just say, no, thanks. I'm full already. <laughs> I don't need a gift of negativity. Your job is to make it positive, but you can't so many, I've, this is what I learned from consulting. This all came from when I was consulting. I saw all these CEOs. They got, the only reason they hire me is they got into this problem. They weren't talking to customers and they were afraid of their revealing to their staff, how they truly felt and thought mm -hmm. they were like going down like a death spiral in their mind because they, they, they were afraid of revealing to their staff. They were scared of where yep. the company was going. Mm -hmm. And I was basically their therapist and I was able to voice, uh, voice the, what everyone, everyone knew, yep. but no one could say it. Mm -hmm. And to me, I just rather, I, I have this culture 
wherever I go of voicing honestly how I feel without making it about me attacking you. I mean, I yep. may feel this way. You may be your responsibility, but my feeling is not your problem yet. My feeling is just how I feel. It indicates, I think there's a problem on our business level. We can talk about that. I don't want to make my negative feelings your negative, your problem, right? I presume you want to make the company successful and your life successful too, no matter how I feel about it. And same thing. And, and my employees also feel they can, and my staff, my colleagues and voice like whatever they feel or emotions and then thoughts. And then I go, that's fine. And then we, let's talk about it at a business level. Yeah. You know, cause that's what they ever, from a professional point of view, you want to have the safety to be a human being, but then get back to the game as a player in the game and be a really top class player and get to the professional level of work. Right. And get back to the rational functioning of yourself. Right. That's what, I, you know, those are people I like working with. And so that's to me, a way of respecting the human and then work, but working as working professionally, which doesn't a lot of people don't understand anymore, but I, it's really important, I think, to most people to know that they to have faith in themselves that they are strongly capable of doing the work and yet still being a normal person. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. Oh, what is balance? That's a complicated question. Um, I mean, I have three kids, so, and then there's a pandemic. So if you don't have balance, uh, then the family would implode. I was kind of, you know, you're forced into it. I, I you know, I don't know. I, to me, uh, I can't, I used, I'm 43 now. So when I was younger, I always compare myself to I'm younger because I apparently hate myself. I want to <laughs> give myself to my twenties <laughs> when I had infinite energy. But I was talking to my friend, Cody, uh, he has four kids now and I have three. And he's like, also like confused why he's like, you know, his, his motivations have changed. Like, Cody, we've had children now. Like, when you're younger, as, as a young man, you know, this is not, you know, this is a generalization, but for me, my experience was, and I believe talking to many of my friends, this is a common experience. Before you have kids, you want to be like, you know, you, you, go, you want to explore, you know, you want to go to the moon, you want to fight in the arena, you have all this like energy to prove yourself in society. But then as soon as you have kids, then your whole mind changes, right? Yep. And you don't want to like mm. protect what you have. And so for me, like, when I was younger, I had no work life balance whatsoever. The moment I had my first kid, I quit FreshBooks. I gave my year's notice uh, when my when my daughter, my oldest was child, was, uh, was born because I wanted to, but I, I couldn't go on the road anymore. I couldn't do 60 hours in the office. Yep. And I've always prioritized my family cohesion over work. Cause like, I mean, like I said, we're, we're in tech, we're basically aristocrats. Like, hmm. like, what does it matter? I mean, what's, what's, you know, I mean, what's a million, five million, 10 million, 20 million? What's the difference? I mean, I'm not going to die with my money, but you know, I will, my kids will continue. And so for me, that's been priority one. I don't know. The longest study on happiness, I think it was a Harvard um, a survey over 70 or 80 years. They started with um, people in Queens and the Bronx around New York, et cetera, all different backgrounds from laborers to doctors, lawyers, you know, professionals. And they asked them the same set of questions, I think every year, if not every couple of years for about 70 years to find out what, you know, what creates the happiness. And it's not money, it's the relationships that you have, that you maintain, whether it's your family or your network of friends. Yeah, I mean, exactly. This is why, you know, ask me what motivates me in business. It's also the relationships, the money, it just doesn't matter. It matters to make it happen. It yep. doesn't matter, but it's not the purpose. It's not the goal. How much professional development have you invested in yourself? Uh, too much. Uh, so <laughs> I lost a bar bet uh, 12 years ago. Was it 12, 13 years ago? Good luck. God help me. And now I run the trade association of all the SaaS partnership people, the cloud software association. So 4,000 something people, you know, if you don't think that's professional development and yeah. investing in it, you're, it's crazy. I run my own, it has a conference. It has a podcast series. It has a Slack community. Oh my God. So much goes on in there. It's obviously helped me understand the partnership function more and more and more. I still have more things to learn, uh, of course. But I mean, and you know, you know, I don't know if you can see it. I don't think this is video recorded, right? But there's uh, my bookshelf is full of books. I have a master's degree in all this stuff yeah. as well. I mean, to me, you know, my mind is, is the only thing I can I invest in that I can take with me no matter what happens, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and so it's worth it to me doesn't mean I read books, business books anymore, because they're kind of like <laughs> silly now, but I read a lot of blog posts. I read a lot of Reddit. I read a lot of people's stories like every day, see what's going on. You know, um, you, you have, you have to, 
I don't know how you can't. Like, you have to. Have you had mentors or coaches along the way? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was in 500 startups. I joined the SAS Growth Academy. I have like tons of mentors when I was younger. I, was getting, I got really close with the extreme programming group, people, the gang of four. People call them when I was an early software developer. You know, I know tons of people on the internet. I mean, when I was younger, when I was 16, I realized you could email anyone on the internet and they would probably reply to you, especially if you're 16. And so I got to know Bjorn Straustrup, as I mentioned, like, you know, you know, all these people, Alan Kay, um, tons and tons of people when I was younger. And then now I have this huge network of people through the association that if I want advice, I could reach out to them for it. Um, like, you know, you can't know everything, but if you have good relationships, people care about you, you know, yeah. It's surprising. Yeah. Do you have a board of directors or advisors? Yeah, there's three of us. There's a, a lead investor, FFVC, AJ, and then um, and then my co-founder and I. And then we have uh, some advisors from the agency world. Yep, right. So, how, how often do you meet? Uh, we try to meet once a quarter with the board. And mm -hmm. then the advisors, they're like around me all the time through the association. So I talk to them like at least one of them once a month, if not more often. Great. All right, Sunil, so we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Customers. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone knows the hardest part of growing is growing. I mean, yeah. you have to go get the market to say, yes, we like it. Telling the market about it, getting them, getting the product that they like, showing it to them, you know, and then all the money it costs. And then when there's like, you're trapped in your basin for two years, like how do you even do half these things? You know, all this stuff. And then I think um, for us, uh, PMF product market fit, was uh, complicated because we're just start, we're trying to target multiple personas of different sides of the product simultaneously. It's a bit too much cookie to eat. Yeah, uh, and so it was really about figuring out who was the best customer. That took a lot of time, and then drilling, getting all the messaging aligned to that, and then really thinking about what the messaging meant. And then building the product. This plumber analogy yep. was not how the product was built. I mean, now the product is built entirely around time and materials. Invoicing is the core concept. You know, and everyone loves it now because it makes so much more sense for them. But we didn't understand that at the beginning. We thought it was about virtual cards. It's not about virtual cards. Virtual cards is a gimmick. So, so all this stuff we had to learn. Uh, and it wasn't like we are one of these companies that was selling hotcakes from the beginning. Like we're trying to invent something completely new and wild. So... I mean, doing that quickly is a re oh, really difficult. That's what I mean. Like, you got to just assume you're, you're wrong all the time. You know. Favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Crossing the Chasm. I was going to ask if you'd read that. That's a great book, isn't it? Oh, I love it. I mean, it's perfect. I mean, it's, uh, I'm a, I, mean, I have an <laughs> academic background, so I'll enjoy the, like, the scholarly nature, but it's so accurate. I mean, yeah. it talks very clearly about how markets, what they are, what it means to you know, build uh, I build into the market. I use it all the time as a partnership person. You know, if you don't live and die by crossing the chasm and innovators dilemma is the other one. Yep. Um, then, you know, you don't really understand what marketing really is in my opinion. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Uh, no, Kagan is probably my most recommended and favorite podcast for sure. Um, listen to them all the time. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business aside from my own yeah uh, um i would say i mean still like mailchimp active campaign email is still the king i mean yeah like it so is and then honestly uh as dinky as it is you could you just say i've grown this trade association but it's on it's a lot of it's spreadsheet space and mm -hmm. no marketing automation because the more marketing automation actually the more angry the members get it still matters on a, if you're doing relationship marketing to really like sit down and like write out an individual message, even if it's two lines to everybody. Um, people could tell whether you wrote it or not. Yeah. Mm. And it, they, it really makes them feel, it's about the feeling you're giving people rather than the message. Yeah. Finally, my favorite question, what would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? Don't be so hard on yourself. For sure. 
Like, so I just had all these ideas. If I was going to be a CEO, I always used to say I'd become a CEO only if I was drag kicking and screaming into it. And so <laughs> it's a lot of work. I mean, I wasn't really suited for it, maybe. And I was so hard on myself about it. Like I had all these expectations. I had to kill it from the beginning. I had to I get all like, you know, get all the like the crazy growth hacks and lean startup stuff. I had to get a product hunt and stuff. None of that really mattered. It was just a matter of can I workmanlike way through all the one risk at a time. And if we get there in the end, because we've got enough risks down, yay. If we didn't, then the market wasn't there. I mean, you know, like we we made we've made progress. We have traction. So you know, is it enough? Hopefully, if it isn't, then it isn't. I mean, it's not a judgment on me, is it? Right. And that I think so many people. I mean, I'm on the um, Reddit entrepreneur. There's so much self judgment, right? Mm, yeah. But you know, like you, you can just take one breath at a time. That's all you can do. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Sunil. I think the audience got a lot of value. Uh, what you've shared with us, <laughs> terrific journey. I'm only a bit over two years old now in market, anyway. I'm growing at 15 percent a month. That's phenomenal growth. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 